Hello and welcome to my YouTube channel called Statistics from A to Z Confusing Concepts Clarified. These videos are based on content from my book of the same name which is published by Wiley. For more information on the book and these videos please visit statisticsfromatoz.com. This is the second video in a planned playlist on samples. It is called Sample Size Part 1, Proportions for Count Data. The third video will be Sample Size Part 2 for measurements and continuous data. See statistics from a to z.com slash videos for the latest status of my videos completed and planned. As usual in the book and in these videos, we'll start by going quickly through a list of keys to understanding, or KTUs, this will give you the overall picture of the concept on a single page. And then we'll go into detailed descriptions of each of the keys. For this video, there are five keys. The first key to understanding tells us that minimum sample sizes are calculated very differently for count data than for measurement data. This video is about sample sizes for proportions of count data. KTU number two says, the report of the results of our statistical analysis might use wording like this. We predict with a 95% level of confidence that candidate A will capture 55% of the vote, plus or minus 3%. Key number three says, when there is an estimate, p hat, for the population of process proportion, the formula for the minimum sample size is n equals p hat times 1 minus p hat times z sub alpha over 2 squared divided by margin of error squared. Keto understanding number four says the following things increase the minimum sample size higher level of confidence, for example, smaller value of alpha, or that is smaller value of alpha selected, smaller margin of error specified, or estimated proportion closer to 0 0.5. After a certain point, um, KTU number 5 says, larger sample sizes yield diminishing returns in accuracy. And here on one page are all five keys to understanding the concept in, of sample size part one. You may wish to pause the video at this point and read them all together. Okay, now let's take a closer look at each key to understanding. First, KTU number one says, minimum sample sizes are calculated very differently for count data and measurement data. This video is about sample sizes for proportions of count data. A proportion is a percentage expressed as a decimal. Here are some examples. 120 voters were surveyed. 66 of the 120 said they'd vote for candidate A. So 66 divided by 120 equals 0 0.55, and thus 0 0.55 is the proportion of voters in the survey who planned to vote for candidate A. In a focus group of 20 people, eight people preferred strawberry ice cream, so that a proportion is eight divided by 20, which equals 0 0.40. And for a process example, in a manufacturing run, which produced 1,000 items, six were found to be defective. So the proportion of items that were defective is six divided by 1,000, or 0 0.006. One might intuitively think that calculations on a production run with sample sizes of 1,000 items should give us accurate results. But what about the other two? How confident are we about the results of a survey of 120 people or the preferences of 20 people in a focus group? Should we get bigger samples? Those questions are exactly what this video is about. The symbol for a proportion is P. That is also the symbol for probability. The two concepts are related. 
If the proportion of people favoring candidate A is 55, 0.55, then the probability of any one person favoring candidate A is also 0.55. If all you want is a quick number for a sample size without understanding what's behind it, uh, this table shows the min minimum sample sizes for a 95% confidence level, uh, the most common, and for several values of the margin of error, symbol MOE or E. Regarding our notation, lowercase n is the sample size and uppercase n is the size of the population or process. These results assume you don't know the population or process size, uppercase n. If you do know uppercase n, divide the sample size above by 1 plus lowercase n divided by uppercase n. But if you have to do that, you might as well just do a web search on sample size calculator and just enter the relevant numbers on one of those websites. Key to understanding number two says the report of a statistical analysis might use a statement like this. We predict with a 95% level of confidence that candidate A will capture 55% of the vote plus or minus 3%. A 95% confidence level means alpha was chosen to be 0.05. That is alpha was chosen to be 5%. The 55% is the proportion P and the plus or minus 3% tells us the margin of error. The concepts of alpha and the level of confidence are covered in depth in my book and in another video, so we won't spend time on them here. Likewise with the test statistic Z, which is used in the formula under KTU number three. We specify the values of alpha and margin of error prior to collecting the sample data and beginning the analysis. Both of these are involved in calculating how large our sample will need to be, as can be seen in the following formula under KTU number three. Key to understanding number three begins by saying, when there is an estimate p hat for the population or process proportion, the formula for the minimum sample size, lowercase n, is uh, lowercase n equals p hat times the quantity one minus p hat times z sub alpha over two squared over MOE squared. This formula assumes you don't know the population size denoted by uppercase n. If you do know uppercase n, divide the n above, the, the lowercase n above, by the quantity one plus lowercase n over uppercase n. Note, as I said before, there are websites which will do all these calculations for you. You just have to bring the inputs, your selected values for alpha and the margin of error, the estimate or default proportion, and the value of uppercase n if known. KTU number three goes on to say, when there is not an estimate, or if you want to take the most conservative ap approach, set p hat equals 0 0.5, and the formula becomes lowercase n equals 0 0.25, times z sub alpha over two squared divided by margin of error squared. Z sub alpha over two is the value of z for a given value of alpha over two. And here we see that selecting alpha, alpha equal to 5% gives us a z sub alpha over two of 1.960. So if we select alpha equals 5%, we get z equals 1.960. If we specify that we want the margin of error to be 3%, we can use the default formula to calculate a sample size. And that would be lowercase n equals 0 0.25 times z sub alpha over 2 squared divided by margin of error squared. So it equals 0 0.25 times 1.960 squared divided by 0 0.03 squared, and that equals 1.67.11. Now we must always round up, so we get 1.068. We will need to pull at least 1,068 people to be 95% confident 
with a 3% margin of error. What if we can't afford the time or money to collect data of this calculated sample size? Let's say we can only afford to poll 625 people. What can we do? With a little algebra, we see that we can plug in a value for lowercase n and then calculate either the margin of error or z sub alpha over 2. This shows we calculate the margin of error given n equals 625, p hat equals 0 0.5, and z sub alpha over 2. So if we reduce the minimum size from 1068 to 625, that increases the margin of error from 3% to about 4%. Now what if we were willing to go to a lower confidence level, giving us a higher level of alpha, while keeping the MOE, the margin of error, at 0 0.03, and the sample size at 625? If we go back to the formula for n and set n to 625, and MOE to 0 0.03, a little algebra will give us z sub a over 2 equals 1.5. From tables of soft or software, we see that this gives us alpha equals 0 0.134. So we must be willing to tolerate a 13.4% probability of an alpha error, which is a false positive, if we want to decrease the sample size from 1068 to 625 while keeping a 3% margin of error. For a given sample size, alpha and margin of error affect each other inversely as these seesaws illustrate. If we select the lower value of alpha, which means a higher level of confidence, the margin of error increases. If we select a higher value for alpha, for alpha the margin of error decreases. The only way to reduce both is to increase the sample size. KTU number four states, the following things increase the minimum sample size. Higher level of confidence, that is a smaller value of alpha, is selected. A smaller margin of error is specified, or the estimated proportion is closer to 0 0.5. Key to understanding number five says, after a certain point, larger sample sizes yield diminishing returns in increases of accuracy. Increasing accuracy here means a lower value for alpha and or the margin of error. We start with the formula n equals 0 0.25 times z sub alpha over 2 squared divided by MOE squared. Notice that the two terms describing the errors z sub alpha over 2 and MOE are squared, while n itself is not. If we solve for either one of those two terms that are squared, we're going to get a square root of n in the denominator. So for example, MOE equals 0 0.5 times z sub l for 2 divided by n. So any reduction in MOE is proportional to the square root of n, not to n itself. For alpha equals 5%, we saw that n equals, zero, n equals 1068 gives us an MOE of 3%. If we increase n by about 1,000, we can reduce the MOE to 2%. If we increase n by about another thousand, we'll reduce the MOE to only 1.79%. This diminishing returns effect continues to get worse after that. Okay, that concludes our sample size part one video. The third and last video on samples and sampling and sample size will be on a sample size for measurements data, which is also known as continuous data. See the videos page on my website, statisticsfromazcom slash videos, for the latest status of videos completed and planned. If you liked this video, please remember to press the thumbs up, like button on your screen. I'll be making more videos of some or most of the 60 plus concepts in the book if folks like you tell me that more videos are wanted. Please subscribe to this channel to be notified when new videos are uploaded. Also, the website, statisticsfromazcom has a listing of available and planned videos. Now, videos like this one can be very helpful, but they're not very handy when you want to quickly look up something on the job while studying or during an open book exam. For that, nothing beats a book or an e-book. You can also learn more about those on the website.
I'd recommend following my blog at statisticsfromazcom slash blog. I've got some things there that hopefully you will find interesting, like a statistics tip of the week series, as well as posts showing that you are not alone if you are confused by statistics. I'll also be posting on the Facebook page, Statistics from A to Z, and on Twitter as at Stats A to Z.